borders are such a curious thing. Look at the border of Iswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. It is overwhelmingly surrounded by the much larger and more powerful South Africa. To say that the South Africans could, hypothetically, exert influence on Iswatini would be a bit of an understatement, though if I'm Iswatini, I consider myself lucky, because at least I'm not Lesudu. We in our modern world like to think of borders as sacrosanct, as immovable, fixed, unquestionable, but they're much more fluid than you may think. Just in the last 50 years or so, we've seen unification, reunification, separation, annexation, infiltration, fluctuation, cessation, uh, nope. Oh hell no, I'm not talking about that. But that last one is really important. It seems almost nowhere in the world is more antithetical to the concept of borders than the modern Middle East. Since almost the beginning of human civilization, the Middle East has been under the purview of almost every conceivable empire of note. This is a map of the modern Middle East, and the modern day nations that exist within it. It has been conquered and or ruled in some form by the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, the Achaemenids, the Macedonians, Romans, Crusaders, Sassanids, the Caliphates, the Ottomans, and finally the Europeans, who created many of the dynamics we see today. There are many other kingdoms and empires, such as Greater Israel, who ruled over the region. Like I said, this is a region that has been passed around more than a soccer ball. That's not to say that, for example, until the French showed up, that someone from Algeria saw no difference between themselves and someone from Lebanon or Syria. But what the colonial powers did was attempt to lay lines in the sand, without taking into account the consequences. They thought what had worked in India would work in Iraq, and the consequences speak for themselves. The nations of the Middle East were never seemingly really nations at all, just provinces under one collective empire after another bound to be separated and reunited at some point under the next reign, and to be reunited together as one nation in the future. Similar languages, religion, dress, and customs. Never quite brothers, but certainly close cousins who grew up together. You may disagree with this assessment. It can certainly seem simplistic and ignore many of the complexities of possibly the most complex region on Earth. But this idea that the nations of the Middle East were better off together than separate was an idea that was more than just popular in the Middle East, especially during the 1950s to the late 1970s. And while not as pervasive as it once was, it is still a topic of conversation, or at the very least, still a wistful fantasy of many in the region to this day. We will discuss the reasons behind the desire for an Arab Union later on, as well as the effects of Pan-Arabism, Socialism, and Cold War politics. But for the moment, let's take a look at how we got where we are now. Let's take a brief look at how the region developed after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, as well as during the late 20th century, and look at the attempts to unify parts or all of the nations and regions in the Middle East, starting off with those that were successful. First, let's take a quick look at the successful unifications and unions in the Middle East since the year 1914. We begin with Saudi Arabia, the Mecca of Arab unifications. Unlike the other entries on this video, the unification of what we now know as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was not accomplished as much through negotiation, but by conquest. Looking at the previous maps of the Middle Eastern conquerors over the centuries and millennia, the vast majority of Saudi Arabia wasn't conquered. Not because it had some amazing armor or defense or army, more because it was sparsely populated and had a hostile desert environment. The main protagonists of this story are the Al Saud family, in particular one Abdul Aziz bin Saud, or as the world would better know him, Ibn Saud. This story takes place during the dying gasps of the Ottoman Empire, during a time of great upheaval for the Middle East, an oft romanticized dream of freedom and liberty against the long colonial oppressor. This, my friends, was the time of the Arab Revolt. 
Unfortunately though, the Arab Revolt is too complicated and long of a topic to be covered in this video, but I bring it up merely to set the scene for what transpires next in the history of the Saudi Arabian people. Now, by the year 1914, there were four possible competitors for hegemony amongst the Arab noble families of Arabia. The Ibn Saud family in the Najd, the Hashemite sheriffs of Mecca, who will crop up again much later in the story in unexpected places, the Ibn Rashids in their capital of Haql, up in the northern part of the peninsula, and the Imam of Yemen. Ibn Saud, who had been in exile and had seen his family lands in the Najd conquered by the Ibn Rashids, had returned to his homeland with a very explicit plan, the revival of the Puritan and militant faith of Wahhabism. But soon, he set his eyes on a much wider goal, to unite Arabia as it had been under his ancestors. When he established control over an Ottoman strip of coast along the Persian Gulf named al Hassa, he suddenly found himself the subject of British interest, who at the time sent a certain officer to open negotiations with him. And then, in a flash, World War I broke out and the world turned upside down. The First World War had two important impacts on Arabia. First was the replacement of Ottoman rule with British influence. The other was a solidifying of the Arab consciousness and a united national sentiment. At this moment, the leader of this movement was one Hussein ibn Ali, the Hashemite Sharif of Mecca, and his newly formed Hejaz Kingdom. Being a direct descendant of the Prophet, as well as the protector of the Holy City, he certainly had the clout to lead such a movement, and it was his fiery nationalism that helped lead the revolt against the Ottoman overlords. 1924 was an eventful year for him. He declared himself Khalifa after the dispossession of the last Turkish Khalif. His son Abdullah became the Emir of the newly formed Transjordan, while his other son Faisal was installed as King of Iraq, and negotiations had begun with the British for an Arab federation of the three kingdoms. But just like that, it all collapsed. Long story short, the British backstabbed their ally when his ambitions outgrew their interests, and thus we mark the meteoric rise of our pal Ibn Saud. By 1924, he had accomplished two major things that had solidified him as an attractive partner. First, he had defeated the Ibn Rashid and ruled over a united Central Arabia. Secondly, he had virtually transformed the traditionally nomadic society into a more settled and sedentary people and lifestyle. In the autumn of that year, his armies made their move against the Hejaz and the Hashemites, and won. Hussein abdicated for his son Ali and fled to Cyprus. Ali managed to hold on for another year, but in the end he went the way of the Ibn Rashids. After the conquest of the Hejaz was completed in 1926, Ibn Saud's control over the peninsula was virtually unassailable, ruling over the newly formed kingdom of Hejaz and Najd, which in 1932 unified to officially become the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as we know it today. Saudi Arabia is one of the most intricate and controversial nations on earth, and is well beyond the bounds of this video in terms of analysis, but what stands out about it in terms of our context is how it unified, not through peaceful resolution or grand ideals, but through conquest and battle. The name of the country stands as a testament to this. They shaped and bent the country to their wills and whims, and presided over the transformation into what we see today. The House of Saud's dominance over the peninsula, and in time over the region at large, is not an especially easy topic to discuss, but seen as how there is no real viable separatist or cessation movements, their rule is in no way threatened or questioned, so the unification of Saudi Arabia must ultimately be labeled as a success, at least for those who brought it about. After almost four long years of agreements and protracted negotiations, the independent nation of the United Arab Emirates was finally declared. The less a country and more a confederation of six, soon to be seven, smaller kingdoms, the newly independent United Arab Emirates was the 132nd member of the United Nations and the 18th member of the Arab League, which was a cause for celebration, because at last, with the declaration of the UAE, the Middle East had achieved the milestone of national independence for all the Arab states. Until this declaration, the UAE had been a British dominion known as the Trucial States since 1820. Though to be fair, the British presence was minimal at best, requiring only a secure region to ensure an uninterrupted communication and transport channel to India. 
by 1971 and included the seven sheikhdoms of Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Ajman, Fujaira, Sharjah, Umm al Quwain, and Ras al Khaimah. Mostly self governing, one of the only real lasting colonial impacts was the backing of a coup against the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi in 1966 when he mismanaged British oil interests. So when the Labour government decided in January 1968 to withdraw from the Persian Gulf, the concern was less about the loss of territory and more about whether the shaky patchwork of sheikhdoms could buck the trend of post-colonial withdrawals and avoid a power struggle that could threaten Anglo-American interests in the region. For their parts, unlike the vast majority of colonial states, the rulers of these Gulfite regions were actually seemingly ambivalent to the British. So when the British formally and finally withdrew from the region, what did they leave behind? The original intent was for a union of the trucial states mentioned earlier, as well as other British protectorates, Qatar and Bahrain. This obviously didn't happen, as the two balked and are now fully independent sovereign nations. But on December 2nd, 1971, six of the former trucial states formally entered into a union known as the United Arab Emirates, with the seventh, Ras al Khaimah, joining a little over a month later on January 10th, 1972. So in the end, what has been the result? The UAE is currently the 8th richest nation on earth, as well as the ninth safest. The modern United Emirates, like Saudi Arabia, is a complicated place to describe, as well it is beyond the scope of this video. But if we are judging it based on the criteria of Arab Union, the UAE must be considered an undoubted and resounding success. On May 22, 1990, when the Yemen Arab Republic, formerly known as North Yemen, and the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, South Yemen, made a formal declaration of unity, many in the world were skeptical. And it's not hard to understand why. South Yemen declared its independence from the British on November 30, 1967. And between then and the day they had declared their unification with North Yemen, the countries had fought two border wars and had grown in very different directions. Although there had seemingly been lip service paid towards the inevitability of unification, there were many officials on both sides who had their doubts. By all accounts, the unification of Yemen began to take shape on April 18, 1988. That was the day North Yemen's president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, and South Yemen's general secretary, Ali Salim al bidah agreed to reduce frontier area tensions, create a buffer zone, and most importantly, revive the unification process. There had been serious efforts made before, one example being a major effort following the first border war in September 1972. But despite initial agreements between the two sides, first in Cairo and then in Tripoli, they failed to fully ratify them. In the years 1977 and 1978, two North and one South Yemeni heads of state were either executed or assassinated. One more border war later, and efforts by the wider Arab world were still having little to no effect. There had seemed to be little real conviction on either side, and the ideological gulf between the two sides forced relations from rapprochement to détente. It seemed to be an endless cycle of suspicions, failed promises, and hardening attitudes. So when the April 18th meeting mentioned earlier declared a revival of the unification process, it's not hard to see why people on both sides and beyond had their doubts. But this time was different, and on November 30th, an agreement was reached to finally and formally unite the two countries into the Republic of Yemen, which it still goes by today. The unification of the two Yemens was by no means a certainty. It had less to do with Arab nationalism and more to do with convenience and de-escalation. And it worked! Though by every conceivable metric, Yemen is a failed state in our modern age, struggling with poverty, terrorism, and being the victim of proxy wars, as well as two civil wars in its brief existence, one of which is still ongoing. The unification of the Yemens was objectively successful, even if the resultant unified state wasn't. In 1990, there were two Yemens, and since then, there has been one. So even though there has been talk of repartitioning the country, until it's official, no matter how crazy it sounds, Yemen has to be placed in the successful category of Arab unifications. 
even if it's only by default and technicality, and even if unification probably did more harm than good in the long run. Congrats? Hey guys, thanks for watching. Uh, that actually brings us to the end of part one. Um, we discussed the unifications and erasures of borders that lasted till this day. The three countries we discussed were all in the Arabian Peninsula, which as a whole has been relatively stable and prosperous for the most part. Um, but in the next video, we're going to be taking a look at the unions that didn't last, as well as some proposals. Uh, this video was just kind of basically meant to set up things. Next video is where we really get into the meat of what we want to talk about, which is the United Arab Republic and uh, Arab Socialism and Pan-Arabism and the crazy and wacky ways in which the borders were changed and how they wanted to change it. Um, this was just kind of meant to talk about the Middle East and, you know, how unifying doesn't always have to be this wild and wacky process. This was just the boring part. So. Keep an eye out, um, I'll be posting the next video, God knows when, you know, there's a lot of art that needs to take place, but hey, thanks for watching, I really appreciate it, uh, subscribe if you liked it, check out my Twitter, I post updates there, and yeah, that's it, take it easy guys.